It's all very well flying through the air, but it's a bit pointless unless we can decide where we're going. We do this, of course, using the controls, but how do they work? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 13 in the Principles of Flight series. Today we're going to be looking at how the control surfaces manipulate the airflow and allow us to manoeuvre the aircraft through the air and fly to where we want to go. This class builds on everything we've learned before and is a good practical application of all those theoretical concepts we've learned up until this point. The main controls on an aircraft are those that provide us with movement around the three main axes. They are the normal axis, the longitudinal and the lateral. The movement around these axes are known as pitch, roll and yaw. Roll is primarily controlled by ailerons on the wings. Pitch is primarily controlled by the elevator at the tail and yaw is primarily controlled by the rudder, also located at the tail. The fundamental concept of a control surface is to modify the camber in the same way that flaps do. This changes the lift distribution and means that there's a large change in the local coefficient of lift. This increase in the local coefficient of lift results in a large force being created and we use that to rotate around the centre of gravity. In contrast to flaps though, instead of only deflecting down, flaps, uh, sorry, control surfaces can move up as well as down to generate this force and the corresponding force will be up or down in direction. If we look at the individual controls quickly, we can see the elevator uses a symmetrical airfoil and the deflection up or down makes a change in the resultant force and this will rotate the aircraft around the lateral axis in pitch. The rudder is exactly the same but we're operating in a different plane, this sort of vertical upright one using the normal axis. Again, any deflection of the rudder either to the left or the right will rotate us around the centre of gravity to the left or to the right. The ailerons on the wings are not always placed on symmetrical airfoils because they're obviously on the wing and quite often that is not a symmetrical airfoil. So what they do is they use a difference between either side to generate this rotational moment. When one aileron drops to increase the lift locally, the opposite side will deflect up and disrupt the airflow and cause a reduction in lift. It won't cause a full downward resultant force because the aerofoil is not symmetrical. It still has that uh, asymmetric shape, that classic aerofoil shape, but it will cause a reduction in the total amount of lift. And this uh, out of balance lift between the upward and the downward going ailerons is why we get that unequal force and we roll um, around the longitudinal axis. We're going to jump a bit deeper into each of the individual controls later on, but first we have to understand some general concepts about controls. The first concept to talk about is something known as feel. As you might expect, it is the feeling of the controls. It's that stiffness and resistance to the movement. The reason for feel is because when we deflect our control surface down and generate this new force that we use to actually turn our aircraft, you essentially end up with a moment being generated. You have this force and the distance that the force um, is generated from, this sort of local center of pressure, is a certain distance away from the hinge of where you actually rotate the control around. That means that uh, force times distance equals a moment and that is in the direction that is opposite to the direction we are deflecting the control. So if we deflect the control down, the force that's generated, because we're increasing the camber, is up the way. Um, and the local center of pressure for the control surface is located here, a certain distance away from the hinge, and you get a resisting feel moment that opposes the motion of the control surface deflecting. The feel moment is directly related to the force produced and the force is generated the same way we do for all of our aerodynamic forces. It's a half rho v squared SCL. 
so we can make some assumptions about our feel moment. Basically, if we have a higher coefficient of lift, we're gonna have a higher force, and that means we're gonna get a more severe feel moment. Higher coefficient of lift from deflecting the controls further. We increase the camber further, which increases that coefficient of lift. Also, if we increase the area, surface area of the control surface, that means that we're gonna get a larger force and more resistance or more feel. And another thing is traveling faster. Higher dynamic pressure means that we're going to struggle more to move the controls. So faster, larger area, and deflecting more all results in larger feel, which means it's harder to move the controls. It can get so severe, in fact, that uh, in large aircraft, you physically can't overcome the controls just with your own muscles. So you have to use powered controls. And you can also assist with this um, by trying to reduce this feel moment and make it easier for that hydraulic system or a manual cable system you use just your brute force for. And you do this through something known as aerodynamic balances. There are quite a few types of aerodynamic balances, but uh, this is just the main ones here. In a normal hinge, you have the hinge point right where the control surface and it meet. So when you generate the force here, your distance is this length here. What you can do is you can use an inset hinge where you move the hinge in and if you generate that same force, the balance arm is shorter and the moment is the force times the distance, you're reducing the distance so that resistive feel moment will be smaller in size. This is what it looks like in 3D. You would have a sort of in-cut into the uh, wing surface itself and it would rotate around uh, this point here. This would be your axis of rotation. Another thing you can do is use a horn balance. A horn balance adds a portion of the control surface in front of the hinge like this. And the area of control surface in front provides an opposing moment to counteract the one created by the control surface. And that counteracting moment reduces the strength of the feel moment and makes it easy for us. Another type is something known as an internal balance, which uses a pressure differential to create an opposing moment and counteract that feel moment. So basically, a flexible seal is placed on the inside between the control surface and the tail or the wing. And when the control surface deflects one way, the flexible seal stretches and creates more space for the air to flow into. So if this was to deflect up, this flexible seal would reduce down like this and you get a lot more pressure in the top than you would in the bottom. And because that is on the opposite side of the hinge, that would counteract our feel moment. Another thing we can do is use balance tabs in order to help us with controlling the control surface itself. Again, balance tabs come in many forms. They're essentially small tabs placed on the trailing edge of the control surface and attached to the main wing or tail itself. When the control surface is deflected, they move in the opposite direction and therefore create a force in the other direction and it poses the moment. This is a typical balance tab here. If you imagine you deflect the control surface down to create a force in this direction, this would still be attached to the wing and it would deflect up the way and create a force this way. So you would get an opposing moment to the feel moment. You also get something called anti-balance tabs, which as you expect are the opposite of the balance tab. It will deflect in the same direction as the control surface. So if we move the control surface down using our uh, physical cable connection, generate a force here, the process of it deflecting down will also deflect this surface down and add to the fuel moment. So you get one moment from the big surface and one moment from the small surface. This basically makes the controls feel artificially heavier and it's useful for reducing the possibility of overstressing the controls and the control surfaces. There's also something known as a servo tab so a servo tab is a method whereby the control input, this would be your cable here, actually moves the tab. 
so it means the pilot only experiences the force from the tab. So if you deflect it down the way to create a force here, the pilot is only feeling this force. But what this does is this small tab essentially flies the big tab. So it would cause this big tab to move up the way and actually generate a force down. Think about it hinged at this point, it deflects down, generates a force this way, which pulls the whole thing up and the overall control surface deflects up the way, generating a force down. One of the problems with a servo tab is that at slow speeds, the deflection of this small servo tab might not be strong enough to actually deflect the whole control surface because it's already a small area and it's a slow speed, the force might actually not actually be strong enough to move the control surface. So one of the ways to get around this is to use a spring tab. The spring tab controls the control surface only above a certain force. So you are directly controlling the control surface and then when it gets too powerful and too much effort to control, the spring will make it control the tab and the tab will fly the control surface in the appropriate direction. So all these methods as well as the aerodynamic balances are just methods to reduce the feel for the pilots. Another way to do that is to just use powered controls. Powered controls can also assist with uh, very large aircraft where the surfaces and the speeds that you travel are simply too high to overcome with manual force. So you can either get a power assisted or fully powered controls. Power assisted essentially just help you to move these cables and you still feel a small amount of these feel moments. With fully powered controls, however, the hinge moment is completely overcome because some motors and hydraulics are moving these cables around and moving the control surfaces so you don't actually have any input. So what you need to implement is an artificial field system. The artificial field system will scale with the speed travelled much like a normal field system would because if the V goes up, our force goes up, our reaction moments and our feel moments go up, we basically artificially generate this feel so that we don't overstress the controls. And because it's scaling according to the speed, this section in here, this is your dynamic pressure, Q, you call um, the feel system a Q feel system if it's in fully powered controls. To control ourselves in pitch or around the lateral axis, we use the elevator. We said earlier that a symmetrical airfoil is used for the horizontal stabilizer or tailplane and that way depending on the direction of elevator deflection the resultant force causes the aircraft to rotate around the center of gravity so if we deflect this surface down we generate an overall force that goes up the way and we rotate around our center of gravity at the front and that will cause us to rotate nose down it's important to note that the direction of the force is opposite to the direction we move because we're located behind the center of gravity. Another way to control ourselves in pitch is through using a stabilator, which is a symmetrical airfoil that moves entirely and therefore creates a local angle of attack to the airflow that is either positive or negative and the resultant force is the same as the angle of attack. So if this whole thing was to deflect down, we see a local angle of attack to the airflow and this local angle of attack generates a downforce in this case and that would rotate us in a nose up motion. Something to note is the concept of trim. Trim is essentially a changing of the neutral point of the control surfaces. This allows the pilots to select an input, you trim and then you can release the pressure that you use to move the controls and the controls will stay where they are. An example we have seen before is with the case of a aft or forward center of gravity, which makes our moment arm for our center of pressure change. So if we have a center of pressure out here, for instance, we get our lift coming off, center of gravity here, and that would cause a nose down rotation. What we can do is then trim our surface to deflect in the appropriate way. In this case, it would have to generate downforce 
and a nose up moment to counteract the nose down moment caused by this lift and center of gravity lift weight couple. The only problem with this is that if we change the neutral point, we will lose part of the range of motion of this surface. So when we've got a normal range of something like this, if we trim it to this point, then we can only deflect up by this much. A bit of a reduction in our range of deflection for one direction. So a solution to solve this problem is to essentially combine a stabilator and an elevator into one. And you end up with something called a trimmable horizontal stabilizer or a THS. And what you do is it's essentially a whole stabilator that will move up or down. And that's what you use to trim. So you get a full range of trim, but then within that, you still always get your full range of elevator deflection. So even if you were up here and you were at the full range of the stabilator, you would still have this arc of motion for the elevator. This is what you see on almost every jet today it is by far the most common because it allows for that full range of motion and it maximizes our control. To control ourselves in yaw or around the normal axis, we use the rudder. We said earlier that a symmetrical airfoil is used for the vertical stabilizer, more commonly known as the fin, and that depending on the direction of rudder deflection, our resultant force becomes either right or left in direction, and if it's a force to the right, that'll locate, rotate us this way, and if it's a force to the left, it'll rotate us this way. When we use the foot pedals to deflect the rudder, the aircraft nose will yaw towards the foot that you have pressed. So if you press the left foot down, it will deflect this surface to the left-hand side. It will essentially pull this over to this way, like this, and it will generate a force out to the right. If you continue to hold your foot down when you fly through the air, you will have the relative airflow hitting the fin at an angle like this. This means that a local angle of attack is formed between the control surface and the fin and the relative airflow. If we were to release our foot and realign everything, we would see that this local angle of attack here means that we create a force this direction. If you think about this as a normal airfoil, the angle of attack produces a reaction force in this direction. This force will then restore this yaw moment back to its original state before we pushed in the foot and made this deflection happen. Hopefully you can see now why it's called a vertical stabilizer. Any airflow coming in from any direction other than straight on causes a local angle of attack and generates a force that will try and restore the aircraft back to the point where the airflow is aligned. This is the same way as the horizontal stabilizer or tailplane works for us in pitch as well. So important point to note is because the rudder and fin rely on airflow and sort of angles of attack, it is possible that this airflow becomes way too steep and the fin stalls. It's a bit strange to think about it the first time because when you're talking about stalling, you're normally associated with the pitch of an aircraft, but this is essentially stalling in a different dimensional plane in this sort of vertical plane. This can become an issue when flying asymmetrically. That means one engine is out and one engine is on because that all causes a yawing motion. We'll look at this at further detail in future classes but essentially to counteract this risk of fin stall, there is a rudder trim system installed. And it's the same as the trimmable horizontal stabilizer, but it just rotates obviously in this axis instead of the uh, axis controlling pitch. To control ourselves in roll or around the longitudinal axis, we use the ailerons. The pair of ailerons act in opposite directions to create unequal amounts of lift on either wing, which leads to this rotation. There's more lift on the left side here than there is on the right, which causes us to rotate clockwise with the left wing going up and the right wing going down. When the wings are moving through the air, the upward going wing, this case on the left, 
has an upward component that modifies the downwash and reduces the angle of the relative angle of attack. If you think about this would be the normal sort of downwash, we add in the upward motion, takes away and we have this new starting point here which makes our angle of attack lower. This means that it actually fights this lift and reduces the strength of it. The opposite thing happens on the downward going wing. So the downward going wing, as soon as it starts rotation, has this added downward component that gets added to the downwash effect. And that means that our angle of attack is greater and that means that a more large amount of lift is produced and it will fight this downward motion. This phenomenon is known as aerodynamic damping because of the added motion of the wings actually rotating, it resists the rotation itself. Another problem with roll is something known as adverse aileron yaw. The wing that travels up through the air has more lift. That's why it is traveling up through the air. Because it's got more lift, it has more induced drag. And that means that when compared to the right-hand side, in this case, the downward going wing, it has a lot more drag than the downward going wing. And that results in this yawing motion towards the wing that is going up. So you rotate up and then you yaw towards it like that. This can be counteracted by changing the levels of deflection on either side so that you get more drag on the uh, aileron that deflects up the way. The aileron deflects up the way which makes the wing go down and the aileron deflects down that goes up. It's quite confusing when you're talking about deflection and the direction of the wing travel itself, but essentially you would make this upward deflecting aileron on the downward going wing deflect more to create a larger amount of drag and have these lines balance out so that it doesn't yaw, it balances out and it's okay. Spoilers are not main controls, um, so are not essential, but you'll see them a lot on large passenger jets. They are upward extending plates placed in front of the trailing edge on the wing's upper surface like this. So this would be your ailerons and your flaps along the trailing edge and these plates deflect up the way into the airflow. Usually they have two functions. They can be either used to assist in roll or as an air brake. So to assist in roll, they will deflect up on the same side as the aileron that deflects up or the downward going wing. This just creates a larger imbalance of lift between the wings and helps with the rotation. The advantage of this on large aircraft is that the wings are flexible and the ailerons can cause a twisting motion at high speeds when they generate these large forces. So by moving some of the responsibility to the spoilers, it means that less force is needed from the ailerons and the twisting becomes less severe. The other function is to be used as an air brake. More commonly, it's called the speed brake. To do this, all the spoilers will just deflect upwards and create a large increase in form drag. This increase in form drag can be used to slow down, it can increase the rate of descent or the angle of descent and just help with controlling the speed in general in a descent. The speed brakes become less effective the slower you fly because they are essentially parasitic drag devices and we know that parasitic drag varies according to V squared. So at high speeds, the difference in drag um, is much more severe than when you're at low speeds. So to summarize quickly then, feel is generated because of the opposite direction moment, because when we deflect the control surface down, force is generated, and because there's a distance between the force and the hinge, a uh, resisting moment is caused or a feel moment is caused. To reduce the effect of this feel moment, we can use aerodynamic balances. So we've got inset hinges, which reduce the balance arm. We've got horn balances, which create uh, another moment in front of the hinge to help oppose the feel moment. And we've got internal balances, which do the same thing as a horn balance, but use air pressure instead. We can also use tabs, which are small control surfaces on the back of the main control surface. A balance tab 
causes a rotational moment in the opposite direction to our feel moment and therefore reduces the strength of that feel moment. An anti-balance tab will actually add to the feel moment and it's used to stop us from overstressing the controls. Another thing is the servo tab and essentially you fly the tab and the tab will fly the control surface. So you deflect this tab down the way, it will lift the whole control surface up the way and the overall resultant force will be down the way. The advantage of this is you only feel the moment that's in the servo tab. The disadvantage is sometimes this servo tab doesn't generate enough force to move the control surfaces when at slow speeds. So in that case, you use a spring tab. And the spring tab will move the control surface directly at slow speeds and then at high speeds will activate the tab and the tab will there after fly the control surface and you'll only feel the feel from the servo tab surface here. To control in pitch, we use a symmetrical tailplane and an elevator or a stabilator, which is an entire moving surface. The elevator deflects to create a force and the aircraft rotates around the center of gravity. And we trim in order to change the neutral point. And the best example of a trim device is a trimmable horizontal stabilizer where a, the whole plane moves and then the elevator can deflect from that, which means we have our full range of motion. Control in yaw, we use a fin and a rudder. Deflection of the rudder will cause a rotation around the center of gravity. There's the concept of side slip, which is when air comes in at an angle, and that will create a local angle of attack towards the fin, and that generating force will rotate us in towards the airflow and correct this side slip. If this airflow comes in at too severe an angle, too high an angle of attack, we can stall the fin, which is very bad for our directional control. So we need to have some sort of rudder trim system, which will trim the neutral point if we are flying asymmetrically, but obviously we're gonna learn about that in future classes. To control ourselves in roll, we use ailerons, and they will create more lift on one side and reduce the amount of lift on the other side to create an imbalance and cause us to roll. All these controls can be combined in various ways, such as the uh, V-tail rudder vators, and you get flapperons and stuff like that as well. Spoilers are used on the upper surface of the wing, and they deflect up the way to either assist in roll, or if they all deflect up, it will be to be used as a speed brake, which will help reduce our speed and this speed brake is way more effective at high speeds due to the parasitic drag being V squared, proportional to V squared. 